They both made a yeah. card! Yeah. Bit, that, that drop show. Welcome to the Drock Show. I am absolutely thrilled about what we're going to be talking about today. Imagine, imagine for a second, if you will, you are a person, a being, uh, on a fantastical world of myth and magic, and one day, through trauma or circumstance, uh, danger, fear, excitement, thrill, a strong emotion awakens a power within you. And along with giving you godly abilities beyond what you could have ever dreamed, it grants you the ability to travel world to world. Uh, you realize that you are not on one planet, but you are on one of many infinite possibilities. And you see all sorts of fantastical worlds, uh, worlds of living machines, worlds entirely overrun by jungle, worlds split apart, and then you come across something strange. In the far-flung future of the 41st millennia, there is only war. So there was a crossover between Magic the Gathering and Warhammer 40k, uh, where there was a non-canon 40k uh, set of decks for Commander, which is a casual format, um, for Magic the Gathering. And that is legitimately what recently got me back into Magic, because I found that so exciting. And I got to thinking recently... What would the lore implications be if it wasn't non-canon? What does that mean exactly? So I'm going to be uh, dropping today about the th horrific and funny lore implications of those two universes colliding. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce our Magic the Gathering corner, Travis. Uh, hello, Travis. Welcome to the Drock Show. Hello, hello. Hello. Um, it's I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, so Travis has been on a lot. We've talked about a lot of Magic Planes, and I thought there's no one better to basically help me keep straight all of the strange details of Magic the Gathering's bizarre lore. Uh, I said a little bit before chat today uh, that Magic the Gathering is basically like 45 different fantasy settings stapled together. Uh, so keeping that all straight is very difficult. And representing the Warhammer 40k corner, we have Tristan. Hello, Tristan. Hello, hello. So, I've been on once before. Yeah, you were on talking about the nature of the warp in Warhammer 40k. Uh, Sean, who I've talked to a couple times about 40k, might be on later as well. He's just having audio issues and can't hear us on Discord. Uh, tried to join, that's part of why today's <laughs> stream's a bit delayed. I want to get right into this. So um, I talked to Tristan a bit about this. How do we see... How does something come into the Warhammer 40k universe? Like, in my mind, and tell me if this makes any sense to you, Travis, I want to start from the Planeswalker perspective, because mm -hmm. Planeswalkers are these beings sure. in Magic the Gathering who, like the intro suggests, very powerful, insanely powerful, travel between dimensions. And I just like to have this idea where, like, there could be some planes that are just, for whatever reason, a little bit more distant, a little harder to get to, and that's how I kind of imagine something like why there wouldn't be planeswalkers all over a world like the 40k universe but why they in theory could still get there in this hypothetical does that make any sense to you travis as our magic expert oh yeah i mean totally uh the the thing about planeswalkers is that they can really like only like they can travel to a plane they've never been to but it's harder yeah um so uh for example, in this, in the Warhammer 40k, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's weird because Warhammer 40k is in space. Yeah. Which, <laughs> and so which, you're like, well... Which I think is immediately the weirdest thing you'd realize is you've come to, like, yeah. let's say you've been to, like, 13 different worlds, and suddenly you go to a galaxy where, like, oh, there's, like, millions of worlds in this dimension. Yeah. Like, immediately and... that would be insane and different. Yeah, so I think it's really kind of the the if you know this if Warhammer 40k universe existed, uh, you know, parallel or alongside this Magic the Gathering universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why the initiative from Magic is called Universes Beyond. Yeah. Um, if a Planeswalker spark they were to ignite, uh, that's the only time where they could travel literally anywhere. Okay. It's, it's random. Oh, Purely so random. it's the ignition point is the only time that you can go anywhere, and after that, you need yeah. to probably have been there before or have, like, a guide? Yeah, or, like, you can find it, but it's like looking 
for a needle in a haystack. Gotcha. So there, there's a plane of magic. Been. There's a plane of magic called Ixalan, where there's um, a relic called the Immortal Sun that basically deactivates the ability to planeswalk. So if planeswalker ends up there, they get yeah. locked, right? Like they're just stuck there. Yeah. Um, so they they were yeah yeah they were now it's gone but it's dealt with but we're not going to get into that but that makes me think that like <laughs> the nature of magic in a plane because every plane kind of has its own rules for magic the only foundation is and this is something mm. only planeswalkers know about as far planeswalkers and nidmas as far as I'm aware that like uh, magical energy to a planeswalker is split between these five colors and they can gather it from the lands itself. Um, and beings on their own worlds tend not to notice that in the same way. And the way that I kind of see is ev evidence, not proof, because it's another like crossover, is the Ravnica setting. Ravnica is a plane from um, from magic. The Ravnica setting for D and D, uh, the colors of magic don't matter because you're just playing as a civilian, and magic to you works. In, it just works. You don't understand its intricacies yeah. um, unless you're Niv Mizzet, because then you're okay. special. Well, you're you are a Draco genius, as yeah. or Draco genius, <laughs> as as he is called. So, the um, way I see it is, um, and we'll go to Tristan now. The warp as this strange interpretation of magic, where magic in this world comes from a dimension. It's all stored in another dimension of thought and uh, emotion. I feel like that could fuck with your ability to planeswalk somewhere. And I, Tra Trav, or sorry, Tristan, how does that all sound to you as the one who knows more about like? the metaphysics of Warhammer. Yeah, I mean, especially, there's a lot of discussed in lore about, uh, like, as you go deeper into the warp, it gets much more chaotic and much less reliable, and that, that there's, like, these individuals who seemingly know much more about the warp than a lot of the main characters, and they say, like, yes, of course you think you know so much, but yet, like, you've only, like, skipped across the surface, effectively. Like, there is so much more to it in this, like, deep warp, which has been even recently discussed in the, some of the more recent Horus, Her Horus Heresy books. Um, okay. And as you go deeper and deeper, it gets so much more chaotic than even uh, the warp that's been explored, which is described as Chaos Incarnate. <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah. so, so the, thought, the thought here is that, like, in the deep warp... Uh, that's the place where whatever the rules of the warp are, where this universe's magic is limited to what is known in this... Oh my god, that makes so much sense. If the warp is th made built by thought, and specifically the thought of people from this world, it makes yeah. absolutely perfect sense that a being from another world would struggle immensely to use magic to access it, and that the only way they really could is th through the deep warp, because that's the place where it is pure chaos. It's no longer held firm and shaped by thought and belief and what is known um so it could actually be, that could be where a being from beyond what this universe knows could come from because if magic in this universe is limited by what is thought of what is believed etc like a, a weird fucking um dragon ghost uh, who travels dimensions would probably struggle to show up because nobody knows about him, nobody thinks about him, so he doesn't exist to this world shaped by belief. Exactly, and as you, like, you get kind of closer to the surface, it, the belief, like you become more solid, and so in order to yeah. be, you know, manifest, you might actually need to be believed in and a, like a conscious idea. Okay, so that could totally explain why it would be hard to get there and how it kind of could still happen in a way, that if like a planeswalker mm -hmm. war, I think the best case would be someone like Jace almost, because the warp is shaped by thought. So Jace is a planeswalker who a lot of what they do is, I mean, one of his cards is called Jace the Mind Mage. Uh, a lot of what he does is mental magic, and I feel like someone like that would have the best chance of surviving the deep warp and reaching the surface because they could sort of shape an idea of themselves and build a material body traveling through the warp. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, like, it's kind of interesting in lore, too, because, like, even the most powerful things that are related to magic, like the Chaos God Zinch, uh, has mm -hmm. been described as being too afraid to go into the deep warp. Oh, that's pretty fucking cool. Mm -hmm. I don't know so that. Even for, like, yeah, so even for, like, the, the most powerful uh, magic users in the universe, it is such a scary and daunting thing. Um, and they, there's one excerpt which describes him sending one of his most powerful uh, greater demons, Kairos Fateweaver, mm -hmm. um, into the Deep Warp, and when he returns, it's described as, like, 
so not it, Kairos didn't come back. Something wearing Kairos came back. Oh my god, I love that. Yeah, uh, and I, another quick uh, aside I just wanted to mention though uh, mm -hmm. is that in, like in canon in uh, Warhammer 40k, there's actually been descriptions of like the creation, the potential creation of another uh, another dimension, specifically the Yanari, the Yanari, um, a group of elves which want to bring back the the elven god of the dead, and so they believe okay. that. If they can gain enough power, enough influence, enough magic, they can create a separate plane that is both heaven, hell, and purgatory, which is literally better than their existence right now. So if and anything so, were going to open the door to outsiders from another universe, it would probably be a project like that. For sure. As well as just that kind of brings up the point that there could already be other universes that aren't explored. I, I love that a lot. I love this idea. So in this canon of the interaction, it basically because the warp exists as a beacon of thought, as, as, a, as shaped by thought, it limits the ability to be accessed by other planes. So we're, however it happens, and I think like a mind mage to me makes the most sense because it's a dimension of, of, of uh, like... Thought and belief, yeah. Yeah, thought and belief. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense for who could get through, someone who specialized uh, in that form of magic. Uh, once one person gets through, other people could, obviously. And um, the first thing that I think is wild to talk about and that I really want to is, at a, at a surface glance, both of these universes have a very similar power level. Uh, and I say that because the power level in 40k um, and magic, it varies all the way in both of them from normal dude to, like, beings that can destroy worlds w by themselves. Uh, which, you know, I think that's fun. I think the big difference is the normal dudes in Warhammer, because they have, like, laser guns, uh, tend to be a bit more powerful than normal dudes in uh, Magic the Gathering. But the thing about Magic the Gathering that I think would be really fucked for people showing up is the the power level of... the common the commonness of very, very powerful beings because of the existence of planeswalkers is so much higher. So Trav, I'm going to start talking about this a bit and I want you to kind of rein me in and, and limit it, but I think a good way to kind of put in perspective of just how powerful planeswalkers is, is looking at Niv-Mizzet. Um, Niv-Mizzet, you, if you look at the D&D &D setting guide for Ravnica, uh, this dragon wizard genius, the only being to understand the inner workings of magic, a, a creature so informed of magic that he was able to use math to discover that the multiverse exists and that planeswalkers exist and that they have more power than him and need to be thought of. He figured out a dude was a planeswalker just by uh, figuring that out and then going, yeah, no, he would be. Uh, he in the D and D set in D and D setting is a ch creature for I think like a level eighteen or twenty party to fight. He breaks the fundamental rules of fifth edition D and D by being able to have two spells he's concentrating on at the same time. Something that the system yeah. is entirely built to avoid. And in Magic the Gathering, a planeswalker can summon him from another dimension and force him to be part of his their army with, like, moderate difficulty. Like, it does, I mean, does, yeah. Like, if, a six-mana spell the, is not crazy. Like, if you were to take the, the game and, and, like, actually apply it to the lore, then mm -hmm. yeah, totally. But, like, just strictly lore speaking... Okay. Um, that cannot happen. Okay. So, uh, so what I... You what, cannot... So fleshy you, you beings cannot, tr like, cannot planeswalk. Like, that is... Like, or sorry, fleshy beings who are not planeswalkers yes. cannot planeswalk. Okay, so they can't they can't travel through what is called the blind eternities. Oh, which I think the blind eternities is, I would say it, it's kind of an equivalent, but like different. It's made out of different goo than the warp, right? Because it's it's a mm. it's a space between space. Okay, right. Holy shit. It, it's something that is that is access. So I just right? thought of something so that here. they can. Mm -hmm. the the quest to go deeper and make a new dimension is uh difficult and things are not surviving nothing has been able to survive even a demon the deep warp we could in this canon ha just say that like the blind eternities effectively is the deep warp Be and planeswalkers the reason they could survive it is because they just can that is a thing they can do oh, because yeah, they've they've awakened this ab 
ability to survive the harshness that is the blind eternity. So they can't um, summon them to other dimensions, though, which makes... It feels weird yeah. for the card game, because the entire point is you build up your army from all across <laughs> different planes. So, like... Yeah, I know, feels, right? That feels so um, weird to me that, like, I thought... I knew that creatures couldn't survive the blind eternities on their own, but I thought, like, Planeswalker summoning was a thing still, because it feels weird that there wouldn't be, like, a so lore explanation could... for how the card game works. Yeah, so the lore, the closest the lore gets is like, for example, uh, my favorite planeswalker, uh, Nissa, mm -hmm. Nissa Ravain, an elf from the plane of Zendikar. Yeah. She can go to any plane and summon an elemental, just because using that plane. Because she builds it out magic. of the elements of that plane. Exactly. Uh, okay. There is a planeswalker named Vivian Reed who uh, she can summon. Uh, she can talk to animals, but she can also she has an artifact that helps her do this, but she can summon animals to, to come help her. Uh, Huatli, mm -hmm. uh, a planeswalker from Ixalan, yeah. can summon, apparently, Lore says, uh -huh. uh, dinosaurs. So she can summon, like, spirits of dinosaurs to help to aid her in so battle. if but... you get a spell that's uh, a Niv-Mizzet, is that more or less you being able to, air quote, summon a, a Niv-Mizzet copy? <laughs> Yes, you are effectively summoning an avatar of Niv Mizzet in the card game. Oh, okay, um, is interesting. What I've kind of taken it as, if you want to make it close to the to yeah. the lore. So, from what I understand, uh, there was a point in Magic's history where planeswalkers were more powerful. We're going to get more into that later because uh, mm -hmm. what I'm drawing here um, is a little bit of a hint to what I'm going, to, what I really want to talk about at some point once we've laid some groundwork. Uh, but at, at one point, planeswalkers were more powerful. And they've been kind of, there was a change in magic lore at some point. Is what I talked about at first more yes. reminiscent of what they used to be? Uh, like, so here's the thing. Uh -huh. um, TLDR, yes. uh, <laughs> planeswalkers used to be equivalent to gods slash demigods, okay. depending how old they got. Right. Um... Then this big thing happened the big called thing. the Mending, Okay. Uh, where uh, a bunch of uh, planeswalkers sacrificed their lives to close a bunch of rifts. A lot of things, a lot of magic stuff happened, and bada bing, bada boom, all of and forevermore, the planeswalkers' power level was uh, turned all the way down to just but being. I can travel planes and do magic. But they That's still it. they still have very very powerful magic from what I understand, right? Yes. Like, yeah. They're they're like, very powerful warriors, sorcerers, and, wizards, and they kill druids. gods every once in a while. That does happen. Uh well, I mean when you, when your magic is centered around strengthening your fighting prowess, then yeah, mm -hmm. you could probably take down a god or two. Okay, so like it varies one to one. Now, I, I want to kind of figure out the modern planeswalker. Where are they power wise? Because in my mind, I see them being a bit above in Warhammer 40k, a pri uh, the average primarch. So primarchs are the effective demigods. They're children of the emperor. He spent forever uh, in a coke bender in a lab with some lady, uh, and they came out with a bunch of dudes based off of his perfect genetics. We're not. We, we can't get into the emperor yet. He's coming up later. Look, I'm drawing him. You know, I'm going to bring him up later. He's right. But Primarchs are these beings granted incredible gifts. And when I think about like their superpowers, like um, Tristan, uh, there's things like Vulcan is basically undying, right? Yeah, it's so one of the like, gifts that uh, the time. Emperor gave to him. Well, except well, he's, he's missing. Like, is he dead or is he just missing? Is he regenerating? It's kind of the question. Hard to say. Really yeah, but he is uh, a, considered in a, a perpetual. So they, they come back. They continue to come back. Yeah. Uh, and then you have Gilliman, best at logistics. Um, can't one of them fly? Yeah, the the Blood Angel, that would be uh, Sanguinius. Sanguinius okay. is, is, is also kind of considered their angel, and that's because I mean, he, he looks like an angel. He's also very good at, at sword fighting. Yeah, he was very good at sword fighting. He was extremely haughty. He was uh, very prideful, beautiful. <laughs> By the way, I want to say the art style that I'd rather do for this piece is like heavy metals, 80s, spray uh, airbrushed on a van, but that would take me like 13 hours to do, so we are not going to be doing that today. Uh, going to yeah. be doing a style where I kind of make it up as I go along. Okay, so when I, when I think of like, 
when I think about the fact that like none of the Primarchs have ever really stood up to anything divine especially well. Um, like mm. they they've held their own at best. It kind of makes me feel like the Planeswalkers, who their gifts are a little bit more broad, like not all of them have super strength, not all of them have um, spells or whatever, whereas uh, I guess, no, there's a lot of variation, because not all of the Primarchs like, are Psychers. For, yeah, for, well, for example, let's, uh, let's say like a sliding scale for Planeswalkers here. Mm -hmm. So there's a Planeswalker who, uh, he's a, a dude with a rat tail, and his magic is creating shields. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. His name's Teo. He's been in one set and one set only. We've never seen him. So that's his magic, is just creating shield. That is it. But then we have a 3,000-year-old uh, necromancer who recently, um, quote-unquote, like lost her immortality, but mm -hmm. she's just still the age that she was. Um, or I think she... It's or I don't know. No, she's, Anyways, she did a stint she's, as a hot professor. With... Yeah, she's now a hot professor, but she's a you know at least a two thousand or a thousand year old necromancer uh, who can control an entire plane, like at her height of her power, with a with an artifact that like helped her helped her a little bit control a plane full of zombies. <laughs> it's an entire uh, like dimension but can we just say planet can i say planet because we're talking about 40k so i want to if we're comparing yeah I, if we're comparing power levels i feel like just saying a planet's oh. population of zombies is like an impressive figure you know i would yeah. say she could probably control like a country's population of zombies okay which um, would go less far in 40k where there are hive cities with several trillion people yeah, mm -hmm. um, but she could but create she could more also... than that if she created like a zombie plague or whatever. Yes. It's just like personally and, you controlling know, there's... that many. Yeah, there is also an artifact that helped her uh, vastly um, control a bunch of zombies, um, but she doesn't use it anymore. But at, her, at the height of her power, mm -hmm. could control hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of zombies. Pretty, pretty um, significant. Yeah. I so, I guess the gods, though, in magic generally would be less powerful. I, I don't think any of the gods in magic's history stand up to the gods of chaos from 40k. Um, like, maybe... No, not... Not, not really. Not even no. the Eldrazi. Like, because the Eldrazi... Uh, oh, that's... The Eldrazi are different because they're, they're not gods. They're not gods. They're yeah, not they are creatures. something from the blind Holy shit, they are something from the blind yeah. eternities. They if yes. in, in our crossover lore, they're basically with the chaos gods, these beings of malignant thought that have tumorized into entities of pure power and concept. Um the the Eldrazi are effectively what the chaos gods are when they are not shaped by thought. Yes. In this crossover canon. Yeah, because like the Eldra yeah, world eating Eldritch can, nightmare noodles. Yeah, Eldritch nightmare noodles. They are world destroyers, reshapers, and rebuilders. Like that's their that's their mm -hmm. purpose. Um. Okay, so I, I want to try to assess planeswalker average planeswalker power level before I get into something. Wait, what? How do you they think they can that carry stuff... at least? Seven folding chairs. They're pretty strong. <laughs> hey, Tristan, you you know mm -hmm. way more about the Primarchs than I do because that is one of the parts of 40k I find least interesting. So I haven't looked into them a lot. <laughs> Sorry, Space Marine fans. I'm, I'm. It's not for me. Uh, it, controlling a large country of zombies personally. Uh, where do you think that like? How does that stack up? to what Primarchs can do, do you figure? Like, that's obviously hard to, like, reason, because it's not, it's not a lifting competition. Um, but let's go gut instinct. Where do we think that is? Um, there actually is a decent amount of variation between the Primarchs. Like, some of them, they're right. only for like, specialized roles in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, like, 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 like uh, the, Gilly I, Boy, who's good at logistics. Yeah, Gilliman, good at logistics. Now he's a bit different. Like, arguably, he might be one of the most powerful, considering in the most recent lore, he has been taken personally to Nurgle's garden, got Nurgle's Whoa. greatest disease, and got better. Yeah, yeah, um, but the but, but Biggie showed up and saved him. 
Exactly, that's the thing. He is kind of a he is truly approaching demigod to like yeah. potentially godhood because true. of the backing of that. Which is true. Be- but anyways, because uh, Biggie is helping him, he is above your yeah. average Primarch now when he used to be the logistics guy. For sure. Uh probably one of the most powerful ones though, Magnus the Red, the Thousand Suns Primarch, the yeah. Primarch uh, I'm building a deck the, for him. Yeah. The Legion uh that was all psychers, they were all wizards, um, very powerful. He accomplished ridiculous like scale things when it comes to like planets like a lot of the most powerful psychers in the universe can just like pop planets yeah like it's th- those aren't really around in the lore anymore because obviously something like that wandering about is too much i mean kind of a weird thing in the setting it's too it's too, too big of a power i level. mean the 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 difference there between magic's two powerful characters and warhammers is um warhammer killed those before their lore started whereas it was a partway through uh, a development decision where uh, Urza did too much and Planeswalkers had to get a nerf. <laughs> like, mid-publication, they had to change it. Yeah, yeah that was... Well, I, I believe they wanted to start making Planeswalker cards, mm-hmm. and they're like... Oh, so it was only about that. A... I thought it was earlier. Uh, well, no, no, like... They wanted to make Planeswalker cards, like, years before years they actually... before they did it. Oh my god, that makes sense, because uh, they're, they're such yeah. a unique design that it makes sense that it would have been something that had to go through a lot of thought and revision. Yeah, so basically a lot of... Uh, obviously a lot of thought went into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it felt like... Flip canvas. Uh, yeah, it, it was just kind of, we need to lower the power level of planeswalkers yeah. that's something we need to do okay. not only narratively yeah. but for gameplay otherwise if you summon in your planeswalker buddies and planeswalkers are powerful enough we talked about this previously me and trav that like generally speaking planeswalkers um when they hit the battlefield they don't get destroyed they have loyalty counters and they just eventually are like hey bud it's been great but i keep getting punched in the face i'm gonna head out uh which is a representation of the fact that they are very powerful by even when a planeswalker goes to your graveyard that's not supposed to represent them dying uh, in lore but yeah so so they nerf planeswalker's powers so it feels like the average planeswalker is probably a little bit below the average primark and the strongest planeswalker is approaching the level of like uh, a stronger primark like magnus because yeah, magnus's shit is pretty whack yeah, he's considered one of the biggest ones. But again, that's also he had in lore had a lot of problems because mm. because he was so in tune with the warp. Like he he was really going nuts, and he could see the future. And so he's like, "All right, I got to do what the future tells me. Like, like I need to change it." And he basically went, it did things that caused problems because of this power. Like he's he has his own issues that kind of nerf him in a sense. Whereas I'm I'm gonna be real, the amount of planeswalkers who are nerfed by their own power with some sort of consequence is, as far as I've seen, quite small. Like they exist. It it, it is a thing where some of them have drawbacks on their powers. Like um, Garuk turned into a werewolf for a while, right, Trevor? Is that that's not related to his planeswalker powers though? No. Well, Garuk never. No, he never turned into oh, a werewolf. Uh, this is cursed. So the thing that he was just cursed. Oh, like wait, wait, wait. Uh, ambiguously so- cursed. He was trying to kill Liliana because she was doing bad, bad stuff. As she does. That's right? the hot professor who controls a planet of zombies. Yes, who can? Um, she now, you know, teaches uh, eighth grade biology. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, she, and... she's black, so she would teach uh, black the magic color, not black the race. So she would teach like, um... oh, wait, yeah, no, black green is biology. So she teaches like biology and yeah. writing. Yeah, that's yeah, that's she's she's a science professor, but also uh, teaches a little <laughs> necromancy to the students on the side. She's like, you know, what's it, dead it can come back. To turns out, um, you can turns use it out, for good. I've done it. It can it can come back. It won't look the same. It will definitely won't smell the same, but it will come back. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, crap. Oh yeah, so they they had a little tiff. And then uh, he wanted to kill her, and so she's like, "Hand of fate, curse you!" And she cursed him, and then he became uh, Garrick. 
Relentless or Garrick something. Hey, he cursed. And his whole like it, yeah, curse. And it was slowly killing him okay, and turning him into like a husk of a of a being and almost into a demon. Uh, so, and his whole purpose was to go and kill planeswalkers. So I'm, what I'm hearing is their powers don't really fuck with them at all. It's just that sometimes bad stuff happens. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of any planeswalker whose power like backfired on them or like controlled them. Not it doesn't, real. It doesn't feel like a thing. They're no, they they have usually full control of their powers, and their powers have zero consequences to themselves, unless, of course, they overexert themselves. Okay, well, but, you, but that's not know, the powers fucking up. That's pushing hard. Yeah. So it, so it's like the prime. So similar power level to Primarchs. You know, I think there's a bit more variation in power level for Planeswalkers. It sounds like than there is for the Primarchs. Um, mm. Because all the Primarchs generally are very, very powerful. It's just like some are more very, very powerful than others. Uh, but the difference is the corrupt gene seed that fucks with the Primarchs can decay in their minds over time. And all of them have like some sort of drawback and their powers can drive them mad. And they have these flaws built into them. And Planeswalkers are just kind of dudes. Like as far as consequences go, they just like get to exist. Yeah, and a lot of the uh, yeah. Primarchs have basically been written out of the, like have been written out of the setting for the most part. Like they're either dead, they're demon Primarchs, um, or they are missing, or now we have Gilliman. And so, Gilliman's pretty much the only loyal one that's around. So I want to the situation that I see. So the reason I want to establish the power level so much is because uh, of how people react to shit generally in 40k, and. Mm -hmm. Just imagining, like, you have this universe where there's constant tensions, everything's collapsing, everyone's looking for threats on all sides, because there are threats on all sides, and the second one Planeswalker can get in because they can survive the Blind Eternities, and they've just randomly shown up uh, because of their spark activating, um, they arrive, they get through the warp, it takes them a while, and they're like, well, that fucking sucked, but here I am, wait, what the shit is going on here, um... If they can introduce the concept of what they are as a planeswalker, I think they can get through the warp now. If enough people know that this is possible and the warp has a concept of them, I don't think the warp keeps planeswalkers out anymore. And once they leave, they can start taking planeswalkers with them. So just imagine how the fuck 40k reacts when like 14 primarch pow uh, power level people just start showing up around the galaxy doing shit and uh, getting involved with their shenanigans. How the fuck does the Imperium of Man react to that? And very like, good question. Very few of, I mean, the, of, they, the, of the Planeswalkers are human, right? Like, not that uh, many. Well, actually, no. There's a, oh, oh, yeah, there's like a, a decent Well, hold on. So, Liliana's human. Liliana's Jace is human. Jace is human. Okay, a lot of Kaya them are human, is human. But there's a lot yeah, that are non-human. Human. Like, they think of Nisa as an Eldar. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Nisa, Ty Varkel, um... I think those are the only two elf. Yeah, so they they be seen as Eldar. I, orcs are barely a thing in Magic, so there I don't think there's any orc yeah. planeswalkers. There isn't. No. Yeah. That's funny actually. You think about there's it. a there's a goblin yeah, in weird. a wheelchair. So he'd be seen as an, as, an, as a uh, what are they called? Gretchen. 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 He'd be seen as yeah. a Gretchen, the goblin in his robot wheelchair. Holy fuck! He'd yep. fit in. He loves scrap. He loves building. Yep. He'd just be yep. seen as like a, a weird crafty Gretchen. The orcs would love him. Me, He'd just be one of random. the guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the boys. He's, he's a he's he's a pretty cool character. Uh, his uh, his name is Doretti. He's a <laughs> he's a cool cool guy in a, in a cool chair. I love um, the idea of yeah. Doretti just showing up to some orcs and being like, "What's up?" And they're like, "You building shit?" And he's like, "Yeah, out of scrap." And they're like, "This is oh, amazing." Yeah. A Gretchen who <laughs> builds. Do that. That's crazy. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that would probably happen, like, it's depending on, like, kind of what their activities were. Like, I don't really know much about uh, the individual's ambitions, and we can kind of go into that in a yeah. moment. But, like, just in general, probably the biggest change would be, like, especially in modern lore. So there is the issue mm -hmm. of, like, how would they travel between worlds? And can, if they can just teleport, I, um, then that kind of holy solves fuck, things. Could they, could they planeswalk to go planet to planet? Is that a thing? I mean, they could probably go through uh, the warp. Oh my god, they could go through the warp, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. If they figured out how to go through then that's fine they said it would take them a little bit to like yeah figure out exactly how to control in a controlled way do that and not just pop out in space yeah <laughs> i think that'd be the real issue but i think they could use the warp because yeah. um because if, if we're going by the one if we're going by the, by the it takes idea, one, one sorry, screw up. It takes one screw up, and you're like, "Oh no!" Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> <I'm> in, <laughs> my my arms turn into squid tentacles now. <laughs> I showed up in the vacuum of space. <laughs> so there are some people, uh, some planeswalkers like Elspeth. I think I know how they do because oh, she's just a powerful she's lady great. who wants to protect humanity. Who would show up, and the Imperium would be like, "Perfect, cool," and I think. Oh my god, but the problem is, she'd show up and be like, hey, I want to protect humanity and do good. And Planeswalkers, generally, in the Magic Universe, are used to a reality where, like, you go world to world, there's all this shit going on, uh, we all have our own agendas. But when shit hits the fan, people who hate each other in Magic generally will join forces, fight for the greater good, and understand that if all, all of them die, there's nothing to fight over, and work together... And I think they would hate looking at how the conflict is resolved in the 4K universe. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. not wrong. I mean, it's just <laughs> so rare for people to work together in 40K. Like, it happens, but so rarely. I think also, um, I don't know 40K's uh, magic rules, mm -hmm. but for example, in. Uh, so, Elspeth, this planeswalker that we're talking about. Uh -huh. Her power is to make everyone around her stronger. Oh, okay. Like, that is her magic. Her I, magic mm. is perfect to lead an army. Because of the like, she is the magic perfect can do pretty much anything. Well, I think, like, Great. there's a chance that she would be seen as, as a saint. Like, this glowing oh, warrior okay. who arrives, wants to do good, and fight for mankind. I think she might be seen as, um... Are, is, are they called the living saints? The angels that come out of the warp? Yep. Living Saints are, or just generally they're, um, I think it's the Living Saints are individuals who have died and come back. Mm. Basically, like, they've been revived by seemingly the Emperor, and they mm. kind of glow, and they have miracles. I'm gonna and pick a tone color stuff. real quick, just so people know what I'm doing. This is a color you put in the background of what you do, so that you have an idea of a grounding tone you're going for with your other colors. Yeah, alright. Continuing. Good. Yeah, so... So, like, probably the biggest faction that would immediately look into them would be the Inquisition. It would really depend on what kind of inquisitors uh, end up finding them. If they're radical, if they are, because like radical inquisitors, um, which is the two factions like radical and puritans, mm -hmm. um, within many other factions. So these are kind of like more dispositions, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, radical uh, inquisitors are more willing to just use whatever works to win. Yeah. Um, mm. They work within the systems, and they kind of have this perspective that they are chosen by the higher ups of the imperium to make that judgment call and so they feel that they are fine and they can usually get away with it to an extent until they get shot um then there's puritans which are basically like no the imperial codes like we we, we rule out we are the ones to enforce the rules no matter what because cutting corners will only let us will make us lose yeah that, um, the so, famous japanese judge who acknowledged that if you followed the legal rations post-World War II, so he starved himself to death because he'd rather follow the rules, that's your Puritan Inquisitors. Yeah, they end up being that way. And, like, in the unfortunate reality, which is kind of what um, 40K plays with in, in themes, is that Pretty much they have a point. Mm -hmm. Well, they have a point, too. Like, if cutting corners yep. often does end up killing you, but it also can make you win, so yep. it's risks. Both sides can be right. I think, I think the issue mm -hmm. Elspeth would have is like being like yeah i'm good and glorious and they're like that's awesome help us that they do good and glorious i think she'd very quickly realize how fucked up the imperium is probably yeah, yeah. uh and what then she would probably have that? an an inner conflict of like wow this is fucked up i want to change it but i can't yeah it, yeah, it's, like, um, it's so big. It's so big that you could yeah. not change it. I still think she'd fight for mankind be because I don't think Eldar would trust her because she's human. Um, but I think only in the sense of like, if there was orcs attacking a planet, she'd help defend and help empower the guardsmen. Um, but I, I don't think she'd ever work within the Imperium. No, no, I don't think so. And plus, like she's. She's not really the type to be like a gun for hire mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like she, she will do good where she sees it needs to be done. Yeah. So I think like if she's on a world that's getting invaded by tyranids, she would like help with the final defense. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I think there's also something terrifying about 40k with these people coming in, where, like, every once in a while in Magic, there is a big event where a plane is under attack, and it's under attack by a threat that if it wins here could spiral out of control and destroy the multiverse, and, like, I think it would fuck... It would fuck up a planeswalker. The fact that like that happens fairly regularly in 40k. That like yeah, uh, this world is under attack by a threat that might end it, and also that threat that might end it might win. And yeah, it could spiral out of control and destroy everyone. And this, that just happens. Yeah, that's Tuesday. That's Tuesday. I mean, what are you talk about. So and so, there's the big difference between the threats of magic and the threats of Warhammer, mm -hmm. where. Mm -hmm. If, like, even if they def they absorb that plane or destroy that plane, mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot more energy and a lot more, like, thought, and they would have time to prepare for that force to move to a different plane of existence. Yes, it's generally pretty Whereas tough for things to move. Whereas Warhammer is just is space. If you it's can space. go through space, you can space, right? Yeah. Like, that is... You just space through space. Simple. You just Simple space lives. through space. Uh, and uh, absolutely, like, th and that means they're, these world-ending threats happen all the time, and they can just go place to place. But I think it would be, like, pretty traumatizing for Planeswalker. Let's just keep going with Elspeth to show up, and there's an event called, oh god, was it War of the Spark, where Nico Bolas, the dragon guy, tried to kill everybody? Yes. So get this, um, Tristan, a god dragon Planeswalker... <laughs> Uh, launched an attack on a planet that's all city. So basically like a functional hive city, a hive planet, um, with a zombie army and all of the planeswalkers show up to fight him off and defend uh, reality. And what I, why I bring that up is because I think it would be so difficult for someone who fought through that to be in the 40k universe and just be there when like, Basically, that happens again. Like, Tyranids show up in a world that are going to destroy the planet. And it and and you just got to relive that. And then you're like, okay, well, we dealt with it, right? And everybody's like, oh, no. Like, there's there's other Hive fleets. There's more Tyranids. It'll happen again. It'll happen again. Like, yeah, we did it. And you're like, no, no, no. This isn't like the end. And you're like, oh. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's, this is what? just a Tuesday. Because the average guardsman, I feel like it would be a big deal because they haven't been through it a bunch of times before. But I think these, like, yeah. demigod-level people would be respected by space marines. And space marines would just be like, no, this is common. This happened. What are you talking about? It's normal. Yeah. So, like, space then, marines or inquisitors are like, no, you you don't understand the scale we're operating on. Like, this, oh, this well, is fuck, going okay. to continue to happen. Yeah. It's like, oh, well. Yeah. Can we get to the root of it? And it's like, <laughs> no. we'd love to. We'd love to. It would, <laughs> we'd love it'd to, be great. champ. It'd, but, it'd, be, uh... it'd be fucking rad if we could, right? You got any yeah. ideas? We're looking uh, for fresh ones. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean, I... so sorry, the, the, you the, the, sorry, the thing with like this the dragon god uh -huh. dude uh, story, <laughs> he wasn't a god at that point yet. Oh, okay. uh, He was trying to... So essentially, he found a spell called the Elder Spell. Oh. And what it was is uh, if you absorbed a certain number of Planeswalker sparks, okay. you would ascend to what Planeswalkers used to be. Right. The, so the, he was the original, old Planeswalker. Where they were insanely powerful and could do wild bonkers exactly. shit. Who he wanted to become a god again. Yeah. Because uh, he was. He was, he was one of the original area, Planeswalkers. Yeah. yeah. And... And then it was foiled because, I don't know, uh, someone grew a conscience. And, yeah. and, uh, and so his, his plans got foiled, but that was his goal. His goal was to turn into a god again. Mm -hmm. And I guess we'll get into this later, but the old planeswalkers were he essentially was called god. god pharaoh. Well, he, no, that's okay. So that's on Amenket, yeah. where he was worshipped. Oh, he god. was worshipped he as a god, god, but he wasn't a god. He oh was my god. It... <laughs> because think about it. You're Joe Schmo on Egypt land, mm -hmm. and you're doing your, your, your desert living, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this dragon just appears. This intelligent, giant dragon. And uh, kills two of your gods that you worship. You know, that'll do just, it. Just... Mercs them. If if there is and, any planeswalker who 
without the retcon, without going back to old lore, I think, just as brief to the side, that I think matches up to Magnus the Red, it is probably oh. Nico Bolas, this dragon we're talking oh, about. Oh, 100%. Like, uh, he is smart, he is powerful, um, he and he's got dad energy. He's the bad guy colors of mana. So, uh, he does, he is the bad guy colors of mana. Um... So anyways, he shows up, he's like, yeah, I killed two of your gods, I can kill more. Or sorry, he killed Scarab, Scorp uh, Scorpion, and Locus. Sorry, he killed three. Okay. He killed three of their gods. And uh, he's like, so yeah, what up? And like, uh, I guess you're a god now. Okay, so... <laughs> Understandable. Oh, hey, yeah. Sean's here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize for the delay. Sean is the also too 52 minute delay. Okay, so... He wasn't a god. Okay, okay, he wasn't a god by their standards. He, but like we said before, planeswalkers, even after they weren't gods by what they'd call gods anymore, they can show up to most yeah. planes and kick the shit out of a god who's there. But I do also Probably. think yeah. most of the primarchs also could. Like I, I think that um, Sanguinius could roll up on um, Theros and beat the shit out of Heliod. Oh, one hundred percent. Like, which would yeah. be very funny for just a big man to show up and punch the shit out of the sun god. <laughs> that would be very... Well, Heliod is, is, is a little bitch. I'm um, the god so... of the sun, order, and law. What do, do you think you can do to challenge me? I'm very pretty and I have swords. Yeah. Violence. Uh, mm. So, Heliod was defeated by the power of belief. So... He was. It, pe Brief people adventure. dreamed about a spear too hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, th so the planeswalker we talked about before, Chaz, Elspeth, we can't sidetrack. Uh, was, all, we can't sidetrack so often. It's okay. Was walking around <laughs> um, the underworld, <laughs> escaping, okay. but at the same time whispering to people, but like, by the way, this spear I have is the real is Heliod's real spear. His spear is a stupid fake, and they're like, yeah, that, that seems sense. Really that sounds real. Makes sense. So that his looks spear like a real stopped being spear. real because people believe too hard because. On yeah. that plane, uh, because it's ancient Greece and worship is important, belief matters. And if you tell everybody, hey, God's a dumb bitch and his spear is fake, that's true now. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is very funny. It is, so, it is very funny, especially when it works. So one thing I just kind of realized is if there's any faction that really fucking benefits from this, like from Magic the Gathering's Planeswalker showing up, hear me out. We got a bunch of people from diverse backgrounds with insane power levels who believe, because of their experiences, that different people coming together to serve a common good is the right thing and what everyone should work for. The fucking Tao are going to love this revelation. Yeah. I don't know. It sounds too warpy and too magic-y. I, I guess, but some of them, their magic is literally just their strong guys. You see, they, they would probably be cool with them. Okay, I, but, I can't see the Tau, considering their recent experiences, really being that into anything that feels arcane. That's a good point, because their belief is turning into a literal god and they hate it. There is a bit of, uh, just like every single person in the 40k setting, there's a lot of hypocrisy. Um, yeah. Like, for example, the big reason why the uh, they started going anti- uh, warp and, and, the, and the like is because they did a big fuck-up where they act, they made some warp engines, activated a bunch of them all at once, oh, and no. shunted them into the warp, and that's one of the big problems with it. And then like later on, they're like, "Oh, that's terrible. We should never do this again." So, anyways, we did it again. Um, <laughs> Guys, but this time not all at once, just one at a time. Okay, that's better. And it went better. That's better. Yeah, it We're really is. Them, like, from sorry. their catastrophes. Exactly. Yeah. So like, the, if there's any like, faction that's good at learning right from idea. their mistakes, it's the Tau. Yeah. I just would love to be in that that boardroom, like, <laughs> okay, guys, we created all these things. What order should we turn them on? And this one guy goes all at once. Oh, we the same go, time. You go hard. Literally, they were warned to like, hey, you really shouldn't do that. We're like, doing it. Yeah, you do don't it. tell me what. To, was it the Eldar who warned them? No, it was their Earth, their Earthcast engineers. Oh my god! So it was. It wasn't even another race to let their racism no. and self bias. It. Oh my god! Hey, Ethereals, dumb fucks. The reason for that though is because the Ethereals are in, a, are in a really bad place because before they actually had a supreme leader, but then the supreme leader is dead. But no one knows he's dead. Oh my god! Uh, and now they just have a council of Ethereals rather than a supreme leader, and they still are thinking they're like using uh, the supreme leader's 
uh, basically hologram. uploaded. Yeah, it's, well, it's oh, yeah. a hologram mixed with his uploaded intelligence. Yeah, you know, it's an you AI. Know what's funny? You know who would yeah. benefit, but because it's so small, no planeswalker would ever run into him because the universe is so big. Fucking Farsight would love these dudes. Probably. He's more uh, utilitarian. Yeah. So Farsight is a Tau Travis who basically was like, shit's whack, shit's dumb, I'm doing my own shit, and uh, left to form his own colony uh, against the urging that like the, any Tau trying to exist or follow the greater good without guidance of the Ethereals were doomed to infighting. And it turns out everything's going fine, actually. Everything's awesome. He's doing great. Except for the I fact mean, that he only owns four planets, so he'll probably die. It's not like he chose to go his own way without the Ethereals. They're all just butchered by demons. I mean, they were yeah. butchered by demons, but then also, uh, wasn't there another thing where when he got back to the Ethereals, they gave him some dumbass order, and he was like, no. Um, so the big thing was that, like, it was previous, like, prior to the butchering, he had had a lot of, like, friction with them, with mm -hmm. basically him being chastised for repairing his own suit and stuff. Right. And then as he, and then he got sent on the expedition as a, as to, to go and settle some new worlds, then all the Ethereals got butchered, he settled those worlds, and he's like, like seems like the Ethereals don't know enough. That's pretty scary. That's a scary thought. I thought they knew everything. There's yeah, so everything. basically, imagine you have this noble priest class that it doesn't even really cross your mind to even question them, yeah. and then you, you don't see think them they shocked. Could be wrong. Exactly, you see them shocked and caught off guard by basically demon monster things that completely defy your understanding of reality. And then you look to them for guidance, and they're freaking out as well. And You're you like, didn't even know that was possible. You, you know what I love about Warhammer 40k is that the people who are wrong and misguided about their belief in reality are the people who believe in cold hard science instead of superstition and ghosts. Yep. I think it's very funny. Yeah. Universe is, is broken. It's bullshit. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I but I think if Planeswalkers could find Farsight, I think that would be a, a match made in heaven. You you have this Probably. dude who's like, what I care about is good and efficacy, and these people who are like, everything here sucks, and no one lets us do anything, and also the non-humans of us are just being shot at on sight everywhere. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and I think that like. Uh... They, because I think Planeswalker's magic would probably be more stable in the 40k wor world because of how we are th theorizing this, at least. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't really be as nearly as concerned about their magic because mm -hmm. one of the big reasons why Tau are concerned is is that, like, they sometimes do magic and then it goes terribly. Mm -hmm. they, they, they would be stable, so. Yeah, it, because, it's like, more it, we're, we're basically theorizing that, like, because the warp is acting like a bubble around this plane. Um, and as you go further out, out of this plane, the warp becomes the blind eternities or magic. And the planeswalkers are inherently built to withstand and survive the blind eternities. And the warp is just a shaped, refined piece of the blind eternities. Because every plane in magic has different magical rules we've established. And the magical rules of this world are, well magic isn't stored in the world directly uh it is stored in this alternate the foggy dimension around us shaped by thought and belief uh and because planeswalkers are naturally attuned to the blind eternities which the warp is made out of their magic's fucking fine here it's going great they're, they're awesome because if there's any constant rule in magic it's that planeswalkers are built different yes that is the rule <laughs> Simple as. Oh, Simple man. as. The one sad part about you telling me that they don't actually summon the creatures, they just summon like an avatar of them, is I don't get the hilarious canon of Magnus the Red being summoned to lead my army of demons and or goblins and fairies. You know, you can keep that canon because I, um, I think it's hilarious to also include uh, un cards um, <laughs> in in this little head canon. Uh, on, on cards for those who don't know is Magic the Gathering set of like cards that are not legal for they, play until they so they're like really comedy. silly. They do comedy sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Joke sets. Yeah. They're, they're so um, I just I love the idea of something getting summoned um, that is like uh, there, are, there were cards in one of the unsets that were half something and you could mm. combine them 
like it was like half kitten, half kangaroo. So you can yeah. just summon these abominations of nature into existence. I I feel um, like if there's those would feel more at place in 40k than any plane in magic aside from Akoria, just because of how yeah. often the warp causes fucked up shit to happen, I think. That's pretty great. Like, um, yeah. like, like I think if a half tractor, half kitten was attacking uh, a space marine, Jesus. they'd be like, oh, I guess it's a mutant, whatever. Or just, ah, oh, it's the warp, man. It's the oh, warp. Man. It, it or you know, Dark Eldar. Or the Dark Eldar yeah. did this for fun. They just do that. They just do that, man. <laughs> just, they just do that. Hey, Dark it's Eldar will just do movie. shit, and you won't like any of it. God, I, they're quirky. I, I feel like <laughs> if if there's anything about that would sell the uh, the planeswalker that they've come to a darker place than normal, it'd be like imagine them them having a conversation with a space marine, and the space marine's like, "So you say you've seen dark things? What have you seen?" And they're like, "Well, you know, um, I, there's a world that I fought on where these robotic entities, these cyber organic beings, were consuming the planet and turning everything cyber organic." Um, the, the devouring all life and turning it metallic, and he'd be like, "It's pretty fucked up. We got, we got, um, we got elves who survive on torture as a as a food source. Um, they have to torture people so their souls don't die. Is a thing we we have here on on the reg. Um, just just you know what's going on with us. Yeah, and they're really they good go. at it. Shit. They're, they're oh, so shit. good at torture. Okay, <laughs> shit, uh, fuck. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> the magic, that's pretty bad. The planes are going to be like, oh, wow, that's that's fucked. That's fucked? Yeah, there's, Sorry. there's like billions of them. What? Um, Yeah. It, they, they live in an interdimensional city, we think. Pretty sure about that one. Pretty sure about that I one. I mean, nope. I think they know. They did invade Kamara at one point. Right, the Space Marines. Right. I forgot uh, they invaded. I forgot they did that. That was all one big play by Vec to kill off his competition, but, you know, it still counts, right? <laughs> yeah. God, that was right. it would be, I think, I wonder how many Planeswalkers would just, like, eventually, like, give up and leave. Because oftentimes the plots in a set, the Planeswalkers who show up get involved in whatever the local goings-ons are and try to fix it and often succeed, um, sometimes at great personal cost. And I feel like Planeswalkers who showed up in the 40k universe would eventually just be like, uh, it's not getting better. Um... Yeah. I I try I, I I tried I tried uh it's I, it's just not it's not it's not gonna I'm going I'm gonna leave I'm sorry. What is the scale of a normal sub dimension or realm a plane? in magic? Like yeah, smaller than a hive world. Yeah. yeah, like it's it's very much um it can range anywhere from the size of say a country to an entire world. And, and um, the planet's bigger than Earth sometimes. Yeah. Like, it, it's not like Earth's the limit. Um, and some planets have very high populations. Like, we've talked about Ravnica earlier before you hopped on, which is a plane that is just one big city that covers almost the entire world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, they're... It's not like they're strangers to scale. It's just that the 40k universe has mul has millions of worlds in it, and some of them are bigger than any planet they would have seen. I think that'd be demoralizing. I, I don't think so. I think they'd think be so? like, oh, wow, this place is huge. Place All is right. Bad. Holy shit. This, this place, okay, okay. I, I see if, what you guys are working with. If I were a planeswalker, I would genuinely start to wonder, wait a minute, are there other planets on other planes I've been to? You see, that's yeah. what I'm thinking, like, is it actually like each world is a plane or is it just that people are lazy? So they'll show up on like this other dimension and be like, oh, wow, there's a whole world here. And then don't look up, well, I guess. I mean, you listen to what the people there believe and none of the people oh, yeah. that they're going to talk to believe that there's other worlds. Yeah. Fair enough. We, we have yet to see any world that we've gone to in magic where they've discovered like space travel or gone beyond their own atmosphere. The closest is actually the recent Unset, which has a bunch of space themed cards. Yes, mm. but that's in a universe that doesn't exist. Yeah. In in the Unverse, as they yeah. call it. Uh um, but yeah, there's yet to be a world where like they have any awareness of uh a reality beyond beyond their planet. Uh 
I'm gonna keep calling yeah. planets. Travis doesn't like it. Some of them are some of them are bubbles or whatever shit. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's not that I don't like it. It's just that like it's not accurate. Accurate. It's not entirely accurate, but whatever. Uh, God. Yeah, so so Travis, I think at this point I want to get yeah. into the topic of the drawing, which is I want each side, uh, Team Warhammer 40k and Team Magic the Gathering, to talk about and. As we've been going, I less and less believe that it would go the way of the drawing I'm doing, where it's somewhat even. Uh, but I want to talk about Planeswalker Urza. Urza, height of his powers, Urza. Urza, who many people believe is the greatest villain, uh, who, as I understand, it, it is became a villain by being so afraid of things falling to darkness again that he felt like the only way to protect reality was to control it himself. Versus Big E, the Emperor, the God Emperor of Mankind, a very powerful man who believed the only way to keep humanity safe was to control them himself. I mean, very similar <laughs> outlooks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the, so here's the thing. T- t- uh, Urza would lose 100%. Th- so Urza loses. We, Urza's out. Oh, God, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Urza's... This isn't going to turn into one of those kind of like. Look, I always find the conversation of oh, but could it feels like oh, could they beat Goku? It's like no, everything in the forty k yeah. universe is like oversized to a comical yeah. degree. So whenever it's like oh, but could X Star Wars things beat something in forty k? It's like no. It, it always feels like no such a really ridiculous conversation. Yeah, I mean, Maybe. it means nothing. No, it doesn't. Yeah. I I like yeah. it to talk about how powers match up. I think that's interesting. Uh, it doesn't determine which one's better. That's dumb. What? Oh yeah, that would be just be dumb. Anyone can say that their character could delete reality with a thought, and, like, does that mean they wrote a good story? Yeah, but yeah. could Goku beat Zinch? Uh, could Goku beat Zinch? Um, no, because Zinch would poison him instead of fist fight. Yeah. Like, let's be real. Zinch ain't fighting fair. That's dumb. Okay. And it's stand, stand a chance. Well, Nash or Goku, mm-hmm. who's hornier for fighting? Uh, no. uh sorry. <laughs> sorry. Slanesh or Goku? Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Hmm. <laughs> uh, hornier for fighting? Goku. Hornier for inflicting p- pain? Slanesh. Slanesh doesn't want to fight. Slanesh wants to win a fight. Or lose a fight. Or lose a fight. Here's the thing. Slanesh is never going to give a guy a sensu bean to have a better fight. You're right. Yeah. Well, yeah, probably not. No. Corn might. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. uh, sorry, back to the conversation you yeah. wanted to have. <laughs> Look, I, I'm okay wandering. Uh, but yeah, to get back to the conversation. So we're just going to say, Urza would probably lose. Let's talk, what does peak Urza look like, though? Because I, I am curious. So, peak Urza, how do I describe it? He... How do you describe it? That's your challenge with, that I put to you. Yeah, without, like... So as I said earlier, and as we keep saying... yeah. Getting into what Planeswalkers used to be before the event called the Mending. Mm -hmm. So, what Planeswalkers used to be were these beings of godlike power. Okay. Like, they could create their own realms. You know, that is something I think the Emperor might struggle with, because he was trying to understand the Webway and wasn't quite there yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Urza, like, you get that's we're gonna you know let's keep a tally in another in another layer. We're gonna keep a, t- a tally. This isn't just a who would win. It's it's a it's just a, an all out competition between the two. Urza, you get a point there, my man. You can create realities. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, like he had enough <laughs> magic to create his own reality. Pretty I'm sick. Double check something. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, you, he then. Do you think create, that he could uh, that he could trap? <laughs> do you think that he could trap a dragon in Mars? Is that a thing he could do? Yeah, he was a powerful enough wizard uh, that he could do that. That's the thing. Like he, right, no points there. Is like if we were to put this into a like an RP, like a tabletop RPG sense, mm-hmm. he would be like a level. I don't think, let's go D and D. A level forty. Wizard. Okay, so like, like literally his... as strong as the god of magic in D anD. d Yeah. Okay. Way, well, actually, way stronger. He's he's way stronger than Nibnizid. 
Uh, uh, in terms of magical yeah. ability. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, and and honestly, things get trapped in stuff all the time. Magic. I something you guys should know. Um, th- the most common end for anything in, in magic is that it is trapped somewhere. That's just a that's a fucking all the time thing. So yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense that he'd be able to just put a dragon in a rock. Uh, yeah. Let's. I mean, let's bounce back and forth for some for some feet scaling. What's a crazy cool thing the God Emperor of Mankind can do, Team Emperor? Well, if we're talking, wait, we're talking again, corpse god or walking about? We're, we're talking walking, walking about. about. These are two okay, men yeah. at the height of their power. Well, I mean, corpse god is arguably more powerful. That's kind of the at the height of their lift power, <laughs> the height of their ability <laughs> to lift <laughs> objects. Uh, really monkey comparison. In all fairness, Urza is dead. He is super dead. Oh, yeah, he died. And he Look, is yeah. Hey, super the god emperor. Dead and gone. We're gonna give a point to the god emperor. You know why? Some of that bone marrow in that chair is alive. <laughs> Ain't no Who'd bone marrow alive. alive. They, they kept him alive, so he gets a point for that. Yeah. Yeah. Could <laughs> be described as alive by some. Yeah, some of his cells are alive. Thus, that's a point over Urza. <laughs> <laughs> so, feet, just feet scaling, Emperor the Man. Some crazy shit he's done. John, you might know actually more of these than I do. It's a good thing he came back. Um... Arguably, he basically broadcasted his, like, will throughout um, the webway and uh, kind of pocket echoed through di- it. Pocket dimension of the warp, he just... Yeah, so he kind of took psycholog- uh, psychic control of the pocket dimension before, you know, there's a huge hole in it. Um, he's currently holding that hole shut. Uh, he's creating a lighthouse in basically I mean, a sea that's, of madness. That's the skeleton through... in the chair. We're... No, 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 no. This okay. is before he was... This is before um, skeleton in the chair. Before, yeah. Okay. So, well, the, the problem is, um, the Horus Heresy, in terms of his power level, he's kind of been oddly reduced. He's more just a side organizer. And it, it's a little bit weird, because like, the, the Horus Heresy makes the Emperor's power level really, like, even more all over the place. Guys, than we might have a competition. Was. Urza might stand a chance. I know, actually. I'm, I'm starting to think, like, no, no, this this guy actually does something. He's probably more powerful than in oh, terms shit. of raw power. Oh, shit. Because, like, in terms yeah, of raw power, probably. It, Urza was an incredible... I. Like I, wizard sorcerer. I do want to go man. through. I genuinely want to kind of compare because I just think they're such similar figures in their in their respective universes. Uh, and and again, this is not to say which one's better. That's an insane perspective. Yeah. Anyone who thinks that really needs to evaluate how they perceive media because that's wild. Weird. Look, do I get a little bit of joy when the character I like more wins the death battle? Yeah, of course I do. But it doesn't make the franchise better. Uh, I guess but, one thing we could describe uh, about the Emperor is a bit better at is, which this is a little hard to say, mm-hmm. like with concrete evidence, is that he may be a perpetual death, thus he can come back from basically any death. True. Like, there is a lot of um, theorizing that the God Emperor, if he were unplugged from the chair, would regenerate his body at some point. Yeah. At eventually. He's basically just being held on life support as a, a rotting corpse, is, is right. the thought. We're going to give him another one. Out. Let's get into okay. creating an army real quick, Sean. I'll get back. So actually, what's your point? All right, let's do creating oh, an I army. I just after. want to quickly say, because um, in terms of like sheer power level things, mm-hmm. like the best example I can think of is Corpse Fur, basically uh, the Storm of the Emperor's Wrath, where he just destroyed multiple massive fleets and basically blotted out a huge chunk of the galaxy for a decade in hellish warp storms through just will. I, um, I, Travis, do you think that Urza could blot out a chunk of the galaxy with storms of magic. He would need a little bit, but I th- I'm sure if he needed to, um, he could probably okay. get the job done. You know but what? it wouldn't be by himself. It would be with, like, he might get assistance or he might build, because that's what, he's an artificer. First and foremost, mm. he began as an artificer. I think because so both he probably be, would build be... something. To do it well because when i get into army building i am technology and assistance is going to be part of it so i think technology gets a count so if he could do it over time i think i'm not going to give a point biggie's already up by two uh already up two to one so i don't think he needs the help so i think if if we think urza could do that after a while like yeah mm. it's not the totally. biggest edge to the emperor i'm gonna say at this you know let's give him a i'm gonna give him a point five <laughs> so the the thing with Urza, like at the quote unquote like height of his power, there's no quote unquote. He, we're we're, yeah, he was, we're he, speaking objectively height of their power. If power means ability to lift objects, yeah. <laughs> um, he 
Yeah, I, I don't think he was, like, physically that strong. But he could build a robot. Uh, to he could build thing. a robot. Let's watch. To be we can't watch Bones in a chair build a robot. So I still think no. these are height of their power that we're comparing. By that, I just want to compare them as living men because comparing a wizard to Bones in a chair is weirder. Yeah. Again, the <laughs> whole Storm of the Emperor's Wrath. That was Corpse Spur. That was when he was in the chair. Oh, I want okay. to make that clear. So, Interesting. Like, because thing is, that's why people say like, oh yeah, his psychic power has only grown because he's mm -hmm. basically being force fed all these psychers. Yeah. I um, mean, it makes sense that his psychic power would grow, and also he just. Yeah. It, there is the theory that I really like it is one I support uh, where he is becoming uh, something akin to the chaos gods, but representing order control, arguably tyranny is the negative aspect. I'd say um, as a worshiped being at this point. Um, I, so to get into army building, Urza built some robots, right? Uh, some. Yeah. He, yeah. he built a lot. I, I know so yeah. little about what this man made. Tell me about his building prowess when it comes to his great army. Um, so, uh, there is a fun little story uh, called The Brothers' War. Okay. Uh, oh, so, yeah, they did uh, a about it. He, they did. Um, so, Urza has a little brother, had a little brother named Mishra. He's dead now. And who is very, very dead. He died. Uh, they, had a, they had a falling out when they were younger um, and they went their separate ways, hated each other. Mishra caused wanted to be absorbed by war. the God machine. All of, or is yeah. So machine? Mishra met the, um, the, what, what do you call them? The biologic cybernetic folks. Yeah, the, um, they're called Phyrexians, but yeah, the, the like, they are. I, yeah. I referred to them as bio organic. I don't know what I referred to them as. I'm not yeah, bio organic or something. <laughs> you Anyways. can check the tape if you're uh, in the audience. Yeah. Uh, so the Phyrexians uh, secretly helped Mishra, but then Urza ended up winning in the end okay. uh, because he was able to activate this thing, this artifact that he found from uh, an ancient uh, civilization that was on Dominaria, which is the land that they're on, mm -hmm. uh, and it exploded. And he ascended to being a planeswalker by, you know, essentially setting off a nuke. Uh, point blank. So he just <laughs> was in a point blank magic nuke, and it made him stronger. Yes. yes, because when his they each had this half of a very powerful magic rock, and then when his brother died, his both ha like both both halves went into Urza's eyeballs and became his eyeballs. That's why um, he's got the glowy eyes. This guy's got glowy eyes yeah. just because he's cool. Yeah. Um. So, for that war, Urza was the chief artificer and developed and built every single war machine. And that was that, before he had Planeswalker powers to help him build faster. Yes. 100, and, like, because once he became a Planeswalker, he became essentially immortal, right? So he just kept learning and kept improving and kept uh, getting better as a, as a builder. Mm. All right. Um... So he's built a he built a robot army. That was before he even had all of his powers. Uh, he's not lived as long, so he doesn't have as much experience and knowledge. But the amount that he knows in the time that he's been alive is very impressive. Uh, now, what did so the emperor built the Thunder Warriors? Right, that was yeah. the first big like human enhancement project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that he had a hand in, yeah. Yeah. And yes, and then after that was the Space Marines when he realized I need to find the hobby gene because these guys don't have hobbies. Uh, so well, it's more like they kept psychologically, like they had severe psychological problems and massive physical problems, and they were just way too unstable to, you know, be used as say an occupying force. They yeah. just they could only destroy, yeah. conquer. Yeah, conquer not... isn't even the right word. It it really is just destroy. So, yeah, not not ideal when you're trying to do some empire building, really. Yeah, they they wouldn't exactly they handle do. garrison duty well. Yeah, wreck the tower. <laughs> yeah, but I just built it. <laughs> so then come the Primarchs, which are just remarkably impressive, where they are built from pieces of his incredibly powerful self. Each one has superpowers. So, Trav, we've talked a bit about uh, the Primarchs before. I. I do think it's fair to say that Urza hasn't built anything quite to their level, but he also built entire robot armies, right? Yes, I would say, yeah. He, he I don't think he's built anything close to the... Here, might well, be a point in Urza's favor. Planeswalker. 
Oh. He built a planeswalker. Oh, so. fuck. Those are Primark level. Yeah. Oh, wait, is, so Karn so, is built by him? So this is a, this feels yeah. like a tie. Like, I think, aren't, like, they, so, yeah. they both built the big There's army a, because the Primarchs turned into space marines. Like, each of them can make space marines, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And they both built super soldiers, but wait, but wait, Urza, he only built one. Yes. He built one planeswalker. This guy built, what, 24? Uh, 21. 21. 21. Well, 21 if you count two as, it, well... Well, how many Alfariuses are there? Hmm. Oh no! <laughs> Fuck no! Because there's there's <laughs> one there's twenty legions and um, one of them has two Primarchs, but they they probably share the same soul, maybe. And so. there might actually be a third. All right, Whoa. Trav. Yeah, is there any know. other? Is there any other like crazy weapons, gear, uh, magical constructions? What specific things in lore has Urza built? I want I want to see if he can win this point because right now I'm leaning God Emperor. Uh, Built the legacy weapon. Okay, what's... Oh, shit. That's... I've used that card. It does a lot. So, essentially, the legacy... So, the... the it's, it's tough to... If Urza was probably put in the Warhammer 40k universe, he probably would have done a lot more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas, more his entire focus... With. Yeah, his entire focus for his entire life was getting rid of the Phyrexians because yeah. they invaded. They also took, like, quote unquote, took his brother and turned him into you this monster. took my monster. brother because he fused uh, with a dragon god willingly. That's your fault. Not, not a god, not a god but right. a, a dragon, dragon robot. Engine. Yeah, that he built. Oh, he that built? I didn't know he built the, the dragon robot. So Mishra was also a master artificer. Um, was always in his brother's shadow was always, you know, Urza was getting all the attention, Mishra got none of it. And mm -hmm. he had little brother syndrome. Um, but yeah, so uh, Urza built this weapon uh, that was a, a combination of a bunch of things uh, that, when fired, was supposed to wipe out all of the Phyrexians. Okay. Yeah. What did it do instead? <laughs> Because they're still well, it, around. It, it did. Oh, it did? Yeah. He built a yeah. genocide cannon. Yes. Okay. Okay, that is that is interesting. How'd they come back? What they're, they're around. What better? Well, the Phyrexians are a lot older than just, like, the events of Dominaria. Okay, so... Like, they, they are... I understand. So they they were elsewhere like, also. Oh yeah, they. So there was an ancient civilization on Dominaria called the Thran. They had run-ins with the Phyrexian. Okay. And then one of their. Um, I, I think I think I I think doctors, I have to abridge this. We have to go quickly because I want to get back to Big E. Fair enough. Uh, the anyways, Urza made big cannon to destroy an entire alien group essentially yeah no that's that's pretty that is a pretty impressive piece of military hardware if you can wipe out an alien race with one firing of the big thing you made it, what does biggie have there because i'm honestly i was leaning emperor here because there's a a pile of primarchs as opposed to one karn the betrayer uh but for primarch level creations but now now I'm switching back to Urza because he did build the genocide cannon. Uh, there was the angel. Oh my god, he did build the angel. That he had yeah, to lock up. Stupid living weapon thing. That mm. yeah, was way too insane. <laughs> yeah, true. It's dubious efficacy for certain. And canonicity as well. Yeah. Oh, oh no. I mean, uh, well, the closest thing I got is like the Psy Titans. Mm. The Psy Titans are pretty fucking bonkers. Again, the problem is, so much of what the Emperor did, it wasn't him personally, so it's yeah. like... Because even the Astartes or the Primarchs, he had well, a lot of help. Let's be honest, every... We hear the story from Urza's perspective, every engineer has a team they're working with. Mm hmm Well, I mean, Urza did have, for a large portion of the Brothers' War, and a little bit afterwards, before the guy died, he had a, an assistant that was equally... Oh, uh, well, you know. Okay. Yeah. 
to the assistant, he was equally as smart as Urza in, in some aspects. Um, a great engineer and uh, artificer in his own right. Uh, went from making toys to making weapons of war. Oh! So, it's yeah. a career change. Yeah. I um, call that a reverse Kaiba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sold I sold military grade weapons, but now I spent all my money upgrading a children's card game. It, it, the funny thing is, he doesn't own the license to Duel Monsters, so he went from building weapons to building like third party additional support hardware for a children's card game. That Which, is very funny. Uh, he also built a theme park for it. I don't know how the licensing works out on that. Um, Side Titans are impressive. They they are. Uh, they are big mechs that use a that use psychic uh, nulls as batteries to create devastating effect. I'm gonna give it to the guy who built the genocide cannon. I think Biggie is still ahead. We got we got two to two and a half. Um, what's another good comparison? What's uh, we've done basically like scale of psychic slash magical powers. We've done building an army and weapons. Um, Talk about their major, their major goals. Yeah. And what, like what how, they want to accomplish in today. I think this one's going to be for Big E for sure. Uh, uh, so, 100%. Uh, maybe. 100%. No, big, well, big E fucked up big time. Big e, they both fucked up big time, though, because, like, the Frexians came back, but... Hmm. So Urza... They say that they, they came back because not of Urza's screw-up. Mm. It was someone else's screw-up. Well, okay, that... God, this is actually tough, because from... Okay, so... How... You know what? Goals, goals. I think, we need to get to after. How did each of them die? So, how did Urza die? What killed the man? Because he, as we see by the the point we gave Emperor earlier, not de not alive anymore. Not breathing. <laughs> no. He, he, he dead. Um... Mm -hmm. So, what unalived yes. Urza... Um, so th when they were fighting the Phyrexians, uh, let me double check here. Uh, Urza was captured, I believe, uh -huh. um, because he was betrayed. Um, and, uh, Ger Gerard, who was, oh God. So Urza started a, essentially like a bloodline. Uh huh. Um, breeding program where he was trying to create perfect soldiers. Okay, so he breeding. was he was on his space marine Eugenics. grind set. <laughs> he was, yeah, one with you know if, and with then better technology they betrayed him or something. Kind of. So they they, oh they, they met <laughs> in men. The, yeah. <laughs> uh, they met in a in a an arena in it was a Phyrexian arena. Um. Wait, they were That's back? where we get the card, Phyrexian Arena. And uh, because they were all being... Uh, so Phyrexia was being controlled by this being named Yogmoth, who is, like... It's hard to describe because he is not a person, because he's such an ancient being. He's more like a, just like an entity at, the, at this point in the story. And Gerard C Capuchin beheaded uh, Urza. The guy he was making super soldiers with. Yes, because he felt like he had to kill Urza or like behead Urza uh -huh. because he was tricking Yogmoth, who is the the big evil, um, the BEG, uh, uh -huh. into like I'm I'm loyal I'm loyal to you so I'm going to kill this guy and so he did he beheaded Urza. Okay. And Urza let it happen, uh, but Urza's head still worked. Ah. Uh <laughs> These men have so much in common. Yeah. Uh, but he died with the activation of the legacy weapon because uh, the two stones in uh, his eyes were part of the legacy weapon. Oh my god. They, they, this is something else that they have somewhat in common, although less directly. Uh, so I'm aware of how Big E died, but you guys know more of the details. So can we get, how did God Emperor of Mankind bite the big one? That's more uh, familiar with Forest Heresy, so you can go ahead. Well, uh, unless they rewrite it in the last Siege of Terra book, which I Always mean, I, like, look, 
Yeah, I, I have some hope they'll they'll do a bit of a do a little bit of a twist there, but I, I doubt it. I, I think the I don't think they'll actually do the like fan theory twist of like no no, no Sanguinius actually killed Horus and then it was Sanguinius that the Emperor faced and <gasps> and that's why he didn't want to kill him because the problem is the story as it stands is like yeah Horus was there. The Emperor basically beams up to the ship. He has to fight Horus, and Horus mortally wounds him. So Horus was one Emperor... of the Primarchs. We should we should give context. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Horus yeah. was one of the one Primarchs. One of the Primarchs, one of his 20 projects. Because I was going to say, like, earlier, it's like, yeah, he made 20 Primarchs, whereas uh, Urzan only made one Super Soldier. But it's like, yeah, two of them were utter failures, and ha half of the remainder turned on him. So I don't really yeah, know if I want to count that as a it, win. Hey, Karn's <laughs> called the Betrayer. Was that by choice, or did he get mind-controlled? That, that will... Uh, uh, Karn is just a broken man. No, 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 no. Oh, Karn, oh, Karn is, is the is thing. Karn. Oh, I forgot there's a Karn in fucking. I forgot one of the Primarchs is a Karn. Nope, no, not no, one of the Primarchs. A, it, one of the, uh, a, no, no. Sorry, wait. He's not called Karn. Wait, what is the. What's the thing? Angron. No, no. What is the thing? He's not Karn. What's the thing that um, Urza made? The. I got him confused because I'm playing Karn the card. The, the planeswalker that Urza made. What's his name? Trav? Uh, the. The the planeswalker that Urza created? Yeah, what's his name? Karn. It, they are Who's Karn! Karn! <laughs> I was right! Holy fuck! They both made a yeah. Karn! Yeah. Indirectly, yes. for one. That is that is very funny. Um Yeah, and they, yeah, because Karn the Betrayer is also is the name yeah. in the Yeah, that's why game. I thought he betrayed him, because I was used to saying Karn the Betrayer, but that's just because they had the same goddamn name. Holy fuck. Yeah, no, Karn was loyal Karn's to the loyal. very end. Okay. Um, well Karn is the betrayer, but Karn is loyal. <laughs> But also, you know how he said that someone made a mistake which brought the Phyrexians back? It was Karn? Was Karn. No. Oh my yeah. god. So just like the Emperor, his project said didn't come to fuck up his plans. Before he walked on it, onto his new plane. <laughs> Karn, Karn, created These a, men! Karn created a world. Why are they all wrestling and destroying? They should be still lamenting and sharing a drink. <laughs> talking about yeah, all that be. they've been through. <laughs> They've led Both such a similar <laughs> life. Both of them I mean, turn to the other over a pint. Sons, am I right? <laughs> Sons, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Did yours betray you too? I mean, no, he was loyal, but he it, it perpetuated the things I died to kill. No, he's just a mess up. He's just a yeah. fuck up. He he for. See, the funny thing is, like he he <laughs> fucked up because he forgot to wipe his feet off before he walked onto his brand new world. Um, ah. and yeah, so the Phyrexians have this thing called Phyrexian oil, which corrupts anything it touches. And so, uh, yeah, he forgot to wipe his feet off and dragged in some Phyrexian oil <laughs> I to find brand it, new world. I find it so fucking funny that I wanted to do this conversation. And part of what I wanted to do was talk about these two guys being somewhat similar. Cause from what I knew of their lore, I was like, yeah. Two dudes who become the villain in people's stories out of a belief that they are the only ones who can protect the world from what they see as an existential threat. And that they do have that in common, but they have so goddamn much more in common, and I find that very funny. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Horus, Horus Dunn showed up. Uh, he beamed him up. They got, they got a fight. What happened next? Well... In the canon as it goes, um, okay, so at this point, Horus was less Horus and more a Demon vessel boy. barely, like, containing the raw power of all four Chaos Gods. Because after Moloch, after he spent what was, from his perspective, thousands of years in uh, the realms of Chaos, and then he almost died, and there's this massive ritual where basically he became more concept than man and more like again he whether or not horus as in the actual guy is still there by the end is debatable uh so anyways they fight um mm -hmm. horus channeling the power of all four chaos gods is critically wounds the emperor the emperor basically finally re oh yeah a bunch of people basically rush in sacrifice themselves to save the emperor um from horus and the emperor finally realizes that his son is gone Th this and... is this is just this is just the chaos yeah, and then basically uses all of his remaining power to unmake Horus, the thing in front of him at least, in every possible way. Both conceptually, like, again, Horus doesn't exist even as a soul. So like, there you, is you're no saying Horus. both of them use the last, both of them were betrayed by someone who helped them make super soldiers. Um, 
one, for different reasons, but both of them were slain by someone who helped make super soldiers uh, briefly, uh, you know, briefly or forever, uh, existed in a way that they shouldn't have been kept alive, and both of them used the last of their power to eradicate what they saw as a an existential threat. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I can't give anybody a point there. I... I'm just amazed at the fact that whichever one of these happened second got a little bit of inspiration is my thought. I mean, yeah. and again, how much... Okay, what the Emperor's plans actually are is... Uh, Who knows? Could be anything. We know he doesn't enigma. like chaos, probably. He doesn't like it, probably. He mm -hmm. made a deal with it, probably. Mm, that one's... Or just nicked it. Yeah. Bamboozled them, maybe. He, he might have bamboozled them. That is possible. I mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't give anybody a point. Uh, so the overall no. goals, it's hard to say because, like, sure, Ur Urza wanted to eradicate the Frexians. He succeeded. Oh, he unsucceeded. Okay, it's not his fault. No, no, he made the thing whose fault it is. It's a little bit his fault. And it's the, his fault. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of his fault. And the God Emperor uh, wanted to eradicate Chaos never succeeded, but a big reason he didn't succeed was the things he made fucking up. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if I can give either of them a point for the efficacy of their plans either. It is kind of a classic story of the great and powerful end up being their own ruin. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing. Uh -huh. um, I guess this could be another competition because the the Emperor would definitely would get this point. But okay. they're like a fighting. Thing. Legacy. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, for this, Ooh. yeah. Urza's Ooh. legacy is, isn't that a card? Is, uh, it's. I think it's Karn. Urza's oh. legacy. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That um, is a card. Okay. You, it's one of his play. It's one of Karn's planeswalker cards. But, Anyways, Urza's legacy uh, is Karn. So his legacy. Oh boy. Um. In, so he's only known, obviously, in within the world of Dominary, which is like the hub world yeah, it, for Magic. If, if there is a main setting for Magic, it is Dominaria. Yeah, but it, it, it's more than just like the main setting. It's like, say, if like if it was a planet system, all of the other planes that were planets would uh, orbit. Dominaria, Dominaria is Holy Terra, really. Like, it, there's no uh, empire. So it's not unified, but like to planeswalkers, it's the main hub. It's where they go yeah. from and to. Um, it, it the closest thing to it in 40k's Holy Terra. Mm. Yeah, probably. I'm just assuming. Holy uh, Terra's Earth, by the way. It's just Earth. for everybody who doesn't. Um, know. It's just what they call Earth. So Urza is known to the denizens of Dominaria mm. as a. Oh boy, a warmonger, a um, just like not a great guy at all. He's helped save Dominaria, but like he was ahead of like a eugenics program that wasn't very good. He completely stripped Dominaria of all of its natural resources, burned, you know, uh, the other denizens, like the merfolk, Just a the real elves pause. of Dominaria. These two men. Okay, we can go back to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's kind of known as just, he's kind of a dick. No one really, like, after he died, and they're like, ah, cool, he saved us, great. Good fucking that guy was, He's a fucking asshole. Like, uh, um, and he was. He was a prick. He taught the um, planeswalker that we follow now, Teferi, um, he Urza taught him. And he's like, yeah, that guy was a fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah, sure, he saved the world, like, countless times, and, you know, I owe him my life, but he's a dick. <laughs> and he had a wife who he actively ignored, um, and she was a queen of, a, of an area, and, again, not a good guy. Okay, so I, I am gonna chalk up a point, as much as it's a flawed legacy, I'm gonna give a legacy point to Big E, because, uh, yeah. He is worshipped as a god, and his bone marrow is holding the galaxy together, kind of. But yeah, and do you guys want to talk quickly about um, Emperor of Mankind's legacy? We can be brief, because I've already given him the point. 
Yeah. He's not remembered as hated by the people he saved. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely left, left legacy among like, in the people's hearts and minds. Uh, he is the, truly their savior, the the inspiration for humanity, the thing that's keeping them together. Um, if you look behind the the veil a little bit, like arguably a lot of the the current situation, well, parts of the big existential threats are kind of his own doing. Like you know, totally Terra being. Um, it could get sucked into the webway or like the webway, or like that the, the hole he's holding closed is ultimately his own making. Yeah. Um, the Imperium Magnus, being, well, yeah, but ultimately Magnus was made by him though. That's what I'm saying. Like ultimately. Oh, um, and like, while there are other, there are other existential threats that could have destroyed humanity by this point. It is hard to say that humanity could not have unified under a different group. So it's one of the... I don't know, John, what are your thoughts on that? Or even cooperated without conquest. I... Yeah. I'm sorry, but, like, humanity during, like, pre-Great Crusade was way too divergent from each other for it to come together, like... I mean, come come together cohesively, yes. I think come together, like, portions of it working together is very likely. Yeah, and it would, would be a be series enough? of small federations that would have been wiped out piece by piece. I, I don't know if there all were... of them would have been wiped out, but a lot of them would. I think there'd be less people alive for certain. I think that if it wasn't for the Emperor, the only... Or something at least similar to the yeah. Emperor, it would have been a series of small polities, and the only humans that were still alive are ones that are out of outside of major warp lanes and webway areas. I, I'd also say that like in, in a universe at this point without the Emperor the Tau just win because if humanity, no matter how, the fact, even the federations that were still alive, I think there would be some, I disagree with you on that, uh, but the ones who were left alive would be so much less populous and so much less pushed to the extremes for resource extraction and production that I think that a group like the Tau showing up would be able to sweep through, subsume and control what remained of humanity so fucking quickly. My two sort of counter arguments is one, there wasn't a single federation at the time that would have had a chance against some of the orc empires that existed pre emperor. Because the emperor broke the major orc empires and also the Rangden, which I can't go. Again, the thing is, I want to say the Rangden would have basically conquered the galaxy, but we don't really know because there's very little known about them. Mm -hmm. All we know is that it chewed through the resources of like half the Imperium for, geez, some, something like 70 years. It took multiple Primarchs and multiple Legions and just mass sacrifice of human lives in order to just hold them back during the first and second Xenocide. Okay. Like, it, it is a threat that we don't know that much about, so it's a little bit weird. Yeah, but whether or not that, that threat would have been like would have been too preoccupied with the other Xeno threats like the Orc Empires and stuff yeah, like that. Like... I, that. That's sort of what I think. Like, I think 40k is a universe where people don't win that easily, usually, because it's such a standstill. I think humanity could have survived without the Imperium, I don't think they'd be the top dogs like they are right now. And, yeah, like, really. it's crumbling, but they are currently in charge. They currently rule the place. Like, I, I think there is an argument to be had, though, for the for humanity not existing without the Emperor. And that's... Mm -hmm. But uh, that is similar to Urza, though, because, like, with Dominaria would have been wiped out by the Phyrexians without him. Like, that's very, very likely. Um... But yeah. I, I, the point is still for the Emperor because he is actually seen as a savior by people now and worshipped as a god uh, and mm -hmm. still doing stuff and holding humanity together, whereas Urza it, it, is dead and disliked. Wait, let's talk about Karn, though. Like, wait. what has he done? Has he been, like, a big mover and shaker it, in the universe? You, has he fixed a lot of things? So, so magic Karn. Yeah, what yeah, is sorry. Karn up to, Tra Trav? Yeah. What's Karn doing? Uh, Karn the Karn not betrayer, has, Karn and, the loyal. So, so essentially, um, <laughs> after he didn't wipe off his feet and dragged in some Phyrexian oil <laughs> and his whole fucking planet got corrupted by Phyrexians, he's like, ah, shit, I need to fix that. And so he tried to fix it the first time, met a couple of other planeswalkers, got corrupted himself, because uh, he got, essentially he became the father of machines and all the Phyrexians called him daddy for a little bit. Uh, but then a strike team went in, saved him, uh, a planeswalker who like sacrificed himself 
uh, gave Karn his spark uh, and like cured him of being corrupted. And then Karn's like, all right, I need to run away and think of a plan of how to defeat these guys. So he's really just been... He's just been trying to trying. fix the problem he saw. He caused, yeah. At least he's, he's trying is the best I can give him. Yeah. Uh, and per, per, uh, presently now, he's been torn to pieces. Oh, and his buddy! Head is being, yeah, his head is being... Cra- he's a machine, right? Yeah, he's a and robot. So his, he's a robot. His head is being cradled by the leader of the the current leader of the Phyrexians. Um, as she's like, "Yes, Father, you'll watch us all become great, just as you planned." He's like, "This is not what I want. This is no, please no, you're all please crazy. no, please no, please no, please stop." And she's like, "Oh, Father, you're joking. You're joking. You're so funny. Yeah. You're so funny, Father. Stop, yeah. stop. I don't like this. I don't like what's happening." Should I call you daddy then? No, no, that, no, stop. that's worse. Worse, worse, worse. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, daddy, um, of, daddy of machines. Because um, I was trying to figure out if I could give Urzan a point here, because I was going to basically make the counter argument of like, because like, uh, the emperor, like Gilliman, is mm-hmm. now back. One of the emperor's sons, one of the Primarchs, yeah. is now back. He's actually leading the Imperium. He's basically going around trying to fix reality, put it back together, and he's he's kind of winning. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's losing and winning, but it's like the losing isn't particularly because of him. Like I'd argue that the the splitting of the galaxy in two is a very big loss for the Imperium. Yeah. But they're also they got big big G. They got Not, yeah. G. Well the the good guys in the story aren't necessarily losing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're just like they have they're, the weapon they're struggling to destroy the threat. Yeah. But they have they wanna go grab Karn, they wanna, you know, uh, cause him unrest in Phyrexia before they detonate it. Um, Which is wild that they care. But we have learned, and thanks to leaks that I have seen, um, some Phyrexians don't make it... Uh, sorry, some Planeswalkers don't make it out um, unscathed, so to say. Yeah, uh, basically um, the Phyrexians have won at least a little bit and have converted some of the Planeswalkers into machines. Into part machine, yeah. Including everyone's favorite golden boy, Jace Balern. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the Emperor definitely wins Legacy because, like, a lot of his sons are fuck-ups who are actively destroying the galaxy and killing people. But he has one son who's leading the like leading humanity and doing his best, and like that's worth something, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I'm. This is taking a lot longer than my drawings normally do. Normally, be done by now. I don't think it's gonna take too much longer. But how? I just want to take a second before we keep the competition between them going to acknowledge like such similar figures. It is funny. I really didn't expect them to be so comparable. So wait, did Urzan like try to he tried to destroy the Phyrexians, but did he also try to like change the fundamentals of reality or was it just this race bad? This evil species. Oh yeah, how did uh, the mending happen? How did planeswalkers get weaker? What's that event? Because I thought it was related to Urza, but I I guess not. It he was there for the mending. So the mending happened when the so there was a point in Magic's story where two planes, the Plane of Wrath, R-A-T-H, and Dominaria, uh, the Phyrexians were collapsing the Plane of Wrath over Dominaria. Um, kind of like a, a Ragnarok type of type of event from, like, um, Norse mythology. lore where it's, you know, yeah, Norse mythology, where it's the, the, the slamming together of all the, of all the worlds. Um, the, so, because the Phyrexians were doing that so that the, the, the space between the planes was more permeable and they were able just to walk into Dominaria from Wrath. Uh, the aftermath of that caused a lot of, like, time rifts and space rifts all over Dominaria and kind of, you know, there's a lot of fuckery that was going on. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um... And so the mending was the act of all of these planeswalkers, what they're called the Nine Titans, getting together and fixing everything. 
um, to put it plainly. And that made Planeswalkers weaker? Yes, because what it did essentially is it fixed the multiverse and it fixed the way reality worked. Um, so it wasn't Urza by himself. It was Urza with a nine other or eight other nine titans. Or I think it was eight other. Anyways, with a bunch of other planeswalkers. Okay. I I don't... I don't know how that works out and does what it does, but, you know, that's, um... I I guess that makes sense. There's so much of magic lore I find I hear about what happened, and I'm like, eh, sure, I don't know. It really is a fair enough, then. I guess if that's what you say happens as a result of that. Yeah, it's... I mean, it's... Jesus. Um, ba -ba -ba, Nine Titans. I'm at the point now where I did not come into this with a plan for how to render it, just that I was going to do limited lines on top of some color blocks, and I am very quickly trying out things to see if there's any form of render I like for this image. <laughs> sometimes I go into these with like a really solid plan for what I'm going to do, and sometimes I'm like, I got 80% of it figured out. I think this works so I think I like this white. Uh, okay. Do we have any last competition we can put between them? Does anyone want to vouch for their side and say something cool that they've done? Uh, or are we going to call it at three and a half to two? I think three and a half to two. I, it, You know, I'm also very surprised of how similar these two are in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, what they've done and, and kind of like the results of what they've done yeah uh obviously urza's is on such a smaller scale but mm -hmm. that's because magic itself is a smaller scale yeah storytelling Ma place. magic now, storytelling warhammer. is is a world of hundreds of worlds uh is the vibe and warhammer is a uh, world of millions yes. of worlds but now warhammer is one of those worlds in magic the gathering so I, not canonically <laughs> but in a non-canon <laughs> crossover yeah 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 <laughs> Although, it is, yeah, it's like 40k is one of those settings that really does like embrace the theme of just it is too big to even conceptualize and it really tries to play with that so it's not super surprising that yeah. magic which is a bit more grounded is a bit is the mm, right prefix for that i would say a bit i mean it is it, in certain yeah. ways a it's bit in other ways, more grounded is a good way to put the difference i, I would say like warham like magic is the only kind of franchise where you can go from a like a neo tokyo esque world mm -hmm. and and then you go to like the jungles of ancient mesoamerica yeah like, like that is it, it is genuinely more diverse of a fantasy climate than uh pathfinder which is wild mm -hmm. yeah uh, which um, is also yeah. why I really love the crossover. And I, I just briefly want to talk about the crossover um, because, like, the actual card game crossover, because we actually all played that together. Um, the four of us did a commander game because I bought the product for myself for my birthday. Uh, well, my wife got it for me because we share finances. Um, so I had the cards. I was so excited. Like I said, it's what got me back into magic. And it was genuinely a blast. And it felt like this really great, like connective tissue between the two universes because they really did an amazing job at interpreting um warhammer lore in a really cool way in the cards um like i i think we i, I want to briefly talk about some, what people think are of uh the crossover and of that but i just want to say one of the things that really stood out to me and that i had a lot of fun with was playing the chaos deck um, we've talked about Magnus, and Magnus's card, the reason I'm building a deck for him, is so cool and well-designed, because the idea is, um, in lore, a lot of what he did was use his army of psychers to enhance what he could do by having a lot of energy to pull from, uh, and in with his card, he makes your instants and sorceries, which are just magic spells and magic, um, 
cheaper to cast for the number of tokens you have because he's making your artificial creatures, your mooks, uh, into batteries for you to use. So you end up in a situation, if you're doing well with Magnus, where you're casting really, really powerful spells that normally are overpriced and people don't cast uh, to get insane effects for the amount of mana, which is the energy system, uh, that would normally be used to cast more reasonable and measured and better pay spells. And I think that feels so apt to how I'd want a, Mag a Magnus deck to work. And that just made me thrilled, and it's why I really wanted to build a deck for him. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts they remember from that night of uh, what they think about the card design and that crossover? Um, for me, I think like, I, you like, guys go first. Hmm. Yeah. Sure, Travis is first. mostly going to be uh, about how he feels about it as a magic set. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys go. Uh, I think it was really, really fun how, like, I, well, I played Tyranids probably the most um, mm -hmm. of the times we played. And I found them pretty representative of how they, like, how, playing them and how the different, like, monsters I summoned and the different spells, like, how it, the play style of it really kind of mm -hmm. felt uh, in line with the themes they often uh, are portrayed within lore, and I thought it that was really cool and feels fun. feels like you're this unstoppable wall of aggression where, like, at, at first it doesn't seem so big, and then it just builds and builds and builds. It does feel like this this thing that if you do not stop at a certain point, this critical threshold, then it will get so big that it would be hard to stop in general. It, like, it just, tsunami. And what's interesting about tsunami. that is I find they actually did a good job with the design of focusing on the lore and gameplay style of each of the factions that they represented. And I mm -hmm. feel like they went more lore-heavy with Tyranids than gameplay from the Warhammer tabletop. Uh, but just in the fact that, like, they're this building horde that when it gets too big you can't hope to put enough men in front of to stop it really felt appropriate for Tyranid lore where they're these creatures that devour uh, biomass and grow to impossible scale. Mm -hmm. What about you, Shiny Boy? Um, I think I, I agree with Lib that just the idea of Magnus being summoned into a magic world and having to basically <laughs> just lead an army of goblins now is, is hilarious and also just kind of just fits this description of what it's like to wander in the warp of like yeah, I guess this is happening now. Does not make any sense? Doesn't have to. I'm cool. <laughs> what? Sense doesn't need to exist. It's the warp. Pretty much. I genuinely feel like if a planeswalker summoned Magnus to fight in a war, uh, he'd just think it was Zinch pulling a fast one. I mean, yeah, that just happens. It's it's kind of implied that like champions of chaos frequently just end up on worlds and like, oh yeah, here's an army. It's like, oh okay, cool. Okay, I don't know what this sick. is. Sick. Um, I'll I'll figure it out. So just one like, time he shows up and it's fairies and goblins. He's like, I don't know, some weird Xenos? Cool. Honestly, wouldn't even be that weird. <laughs> like, Matarian once led an army of mushrooms, and he's like, damn. <laughs> they sure are I walking mushrooms. That. Oh my god. That's Why great. being the, uh, the Chaos Prime Market with Nurgle. So. Yeah. It's like, damn, mushrooms I sure like... This. I sure am not a wizard. <laughs> shoots bees. <laughs> Sure. You, you. I think the first game played my favorite deck, which is the Imperium of Man. It's the only that and Necrons are the two that instead of um, taking apart to upgrade decks, uh, I'm just keeping full together and upgrading that one and its core concept uh, because I really love the Imperium deck. It feels so apt for how they should play because it's all like go wide and use an onslaught of men. Uh, yeah. And then, Trav, what was your opinion of it, of, of playing this great crossover? Um, well, I think for one, uh, they are arguably, not even arguably, they're the best commander decks that Magic has made. They, so uh, well designed. Can, they played together so well, yeah. too. Like, they clearly thought about how each one would interact. Yeah, totally. Like, they all stop each other. They all like they all have answers for each other. Uh -huh. They also have like um, adv distinct advantages over the others, or like some of them do better in the early game, some of them do better in the late game. Some of them have cards uh, that act as a hard counter to one of the decks, like um, exactly the the graveyard hate cards in Chaos that just fuck <laughs> over Necrons. Totally, um, and like uh, the Imperium's overwhelming numbers, and as you guys said, mm -hmm. I'm you know I've been dabbling a little bit into warhammer 40k lore because it's it's it is interesting totally it's a, it's and i really think cool it's setting. it is partly to the uh, the result of these decks 
after playing with these cards and like looking at the artwork and um, really like getting a feel for how these decks play, which kind of as I've also kind of learned, like the it really kind of aligns with the way that um, these groups in in Warhammer 40k operate. Um, if you were to convert it, obviously, to a card game, mm-hmm. not a uh, miniatures <laughs> tabletop game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, no, the, the decks were so incredibly designed. Um, the cards were so much fun. Uh, the, the mechanics they developed for... Because uh, I know the Imperium got its own mechanic. Tyranids got a new, like, its own mechanic. And I think that's it. Yeah, so I think the other two just use they mechanics use that already decks. existed. I, I also um, think chaos was such as much as it's the weakest of the decks was so much fun in design because it gave them an excuse to have a deck that more because it's chaos undivided, which means it can't fit a central theme the way one chaos god could. But it gave them an excuse yeah. to build a deck that instead of focusing on efficacy was just a blast to have at the table because it did wacky bullshit all the time. It was so fun. Like, <laughs> yeah, it it adds such a presence to the table. It's why I'm actually kind of reluctant to take apart my Chaos deck fully, because, like, sure, you're really unlikely to win with it, but you do such fun shit, and every time you do something, it's a goddamn blast that changes the entire board, and I love that. Uh, yeah, I loved the I loved it as a product. Um, I'm actually looking into have, finding someone with legal knowledge uh, for my next stream to talk about um, Wizards of the Coast changing their open game license for D and D. So next week, probably gonna have a much less uh, positive view of Wizards of the Coast than I do in this Scott talk. Yeah. But the Warhammer 40k decks were such a perfect way to get back into Magic, and they came out in a year where. Magic did some of its best and some of its worst at the same time. It's been such a weird and wacky, wild time to come back to. Uh, but those decks stand out to me as some of the most fun I've had in gaming. Um, they're so fantastic. I, If anyone here has played Magic in the past, anyone watching on YouTube, uh, played Magic in the past, really likes liked it, has fond memories, and... Um, is a fan of 40k. I could not recommend more hi- uh, highly that you pick it up because they're doing a third reprint now because they're selling so well they just keep reprinting more and more of these decks because it was just a blast to play and I think really highlights uh, the what makes 40k such an interesting setting in promoting such cool card design while also showing the amazing games and uh, interactions that can exist in Magic as a game. Thank you guys so much for being on. I had a blast talking to everybody. I love crossovers so goddamn much. So this also just appealed to me at a deep level. I like crossovers more than is reasonable for someone to like them. Like, <laughs> intrinsically, when something has multiple franchises together, I'm like, ooh, what? Ooh. Uh, so getting to talk about how these two line up to each other and how they compare, uh, absolute blast for me. I love it. And discovering how similar Ursa and the God Emperor are is so weirdly fun for me. It is a surprise. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really fun. Someone in mm-hmm. the comments, um, tell me which one of these happened first so that we can know who got me who. Uh, and additionally, please in the comments, everybody, remember to like, comment, subscribe. And additionally, tell me why we're wrong. Tell me why the score shouldn't have been two to three and a half. Uh, Tell me why I'm dumb forever suggesting so. And uh, make sure you make it clear who should win, why it's an absolute dunk, and why your franchise is better because uh, your big wizard who built super soldiers is actually the good one. It's very important that I know. Or at least the really cool one. Or the really cool one. Yeah. All right. Thanks for being on, guys. Have a good night, everybody. Hope yeah, y'all are Sorry, I was late. <laughs> hey, no problem for being late. And if you want to be on to tell me about uh, your interests, your expertise, if you want to be on to correct me about this and tell me why I'm wrong, uh, please join the Discord. I love having people on. I absolutely want to have conversations with people who disagree with me uh, or who just want to talk about their interests or expertise or characters they love that they've made or uh, experienced. Other than that, everybody, have a good one.
sons, am I right? <laughs> sons, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>